Yes, circle, circle, there we go. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Rahman, and she is an OBGYN doctor who is also plant-based. She practices in Philadelphia. We're going to learn more about her today, and she's going to talk about how <gasps> food can oh, actually... Stop. Stop. actually... Oh, oh I'm that, my no, battery. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, my goodness. Um, I have it plugged in, and it's saying my battery is low. I can't believe this. Oh, that is not good. That is not good if your battery is low, because uh, okay, we'll need some power. I'm, yeah, we definitely do. Um, I wish I could help you, but I'm in Big Bear. This is <laughs> like a comedy I've never seen. It's actually plugged in. Let me, I'm going to move things around, move it closer to a different level. Well, in the meantime, we can see your beautiful artwork. Hi, guys. Thanks for being here. Hi, Daryl. I see you and Robin. Diane, I hope you're feeling better. Karen, Jesse, these are what we call the usual suspects. My, Melissa, Mandy, Stephanie, Colleen. Okay, I plugged it directly into the outlet. It's okay. I think we're good. Sorry about that. Great. No, no, no worries. No, no, no worries at all. And uh, well, let's, you want to just start with the PowerPoint just so we don't take any chances in case the battery power goes. No, we're good. We're good. We're, we're good. good. Okay. I'm, I'm well, optimistic. Then... I'm optimistic. This will work. Good. Well, you, you have, you have uh, you're obviously beautiful doctor, lady, woman, and your artwork is equally beautiful. So I love your set. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm curious to know, um, because I don't think I've met an OBGYN who was plant-based, how you first got introduced to plant-based eating. Oh, um, it's been a long journey and a very long story. The truth of the matter is that growing up, I always heard that you should eat to live and not live to eat. Um, and it's only been after many years of seeing an improvement in my own health, um, seeing the effect of other family members, and then seeing it in my patients that I knew that this was the right choice, not just for me, but for other women also. Nice, and how long has it been for you? Oh, I don't know if I can put a time to it because it was a very gradual thing. I remember at one point, no chicken, but I would eat eggs, and then it was like no eggs, and then it was no fish, and then it was, um, I'm not going to have cheese. And it was a very gradual process. And for me, I knew that I had transitioned when I no longer had the cravings. And so I can say, honestly, there have been no cravings for about five years. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, a lot of times when we think of plant-based diets, a lot of times a lot of cardiologists are plant-based and I'm, I'm, maybe you're familiar with Dr. Kim Williams, a former past president of the American College of Cardiology, who said there's two kinds of cardiologists, vegan and those who don't read the data. But do plant-based eating and female health really go hand in hand? Because I don't know if that's the first thing that most obstetricians or gynecologists are thinking when they're treating their patients. Their food has anything to do with things like yeah, and that was that was the arc for me. That was the journey to stop seeing food as something that I use to soothe myself or I use it as my comfort, um, but seeing food as medicine. I think many of us see medicine as pharmaceuticals and or surgery. And if it's not one or the other, then it's not really medicine. And so seeing food as medicine takes a shift in your thinking. Right. Do you think it's important that women eat well even before they get pregnant? Because that is, isn't that a very important time for the development of the baby? Because once, once they're pregnant, it's, I don't want to say it's too late, but I, I don't think prenatal eating is discussed a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially given um, our food sources and how we prepare food for the masses, it becomes very critical. And I hope to talk a little bit more about that in my presentation. Great, well, anytime you're ready to start, please feel free. Okay, all right, so um, the screen may go blank momentarily, but 
the slides will come right up. Okay, hopefully you can see the screen. I can, I see a beautiful purple cabbage and green broccoli and orange carrots and kale. Oh, all right, so we're good. So to begin, like I said earlier, it was a very slow journey for me to veganism and an even slower journey before I really started to think of food as medicine. I had grown up hearing eat to live, um, not live to eat. And I had been impressed in the past with people like Dr. Um, Alvinio Fulton, a nutritionist, and the late Dick Gregory, who was a comedian turned activist, who both espoused dietary changes, fasting, um, vegan lifestyle. But it wasn't until I actually saw a benefit in my own life, I saw differences in family members, and then more importantly, in patients that I realized that there's a clear benefit to eating well, meaning eating a vegan diet um, and seeing food as medicine. Food has a lot of connotations for us, but we should always see food as medicine. So I would like to um, discuss food as medicine in terms of female health issues. Um, feel free to stop me along the way or I'll just keep, I'll just keep talking. Great, thank you. I love, I love the idea of food as medicine and living, not living to eat, but eating to live, which is the name of Dr. Joel Furman's book, Eat to Live. Sure. So um, today I'm not going to try to talk about everything. I'm going to just give um, four different examples of common female conditions and how food could play a part in improving our health conditions. And those four, as you can see, are vaginitis, fibroids, menopause, and basically talking about the pregnant woman and our progeny. Now, none of these things are considered life-threatening or as quote unquote serious as cancer or end-stage cardiovascular disease. But if you're a woman and if you've had any of these conditions, you know that it can definitely affect the quality of your life. And so for that reason, it's worth knowing about and understanding the impact of food. Um, I should say that um, you're never too, you may be too young to see a gynecologist, but you're never too old. I love that because I was gonna ask you, is there a certain age after which we should stop having pap smears? So things change for a woman. For instance, I think all women now realize that you don't necessarily get a pap smear every year. In fact, at the age of 65, if you've not had an abnormal pap smear, um, pap smears are discontinued altogether. Other things sometimes uh, are then ordered like bone density tests. But clearly, if you have a female issue, you need to see a gynecologist because things can still happen. There's lichen sclerosis, there are, there's abnormal bleeding, other reasons which mean you need to see a gynecologist. Right, thank you. All right, so the first, vaginitis. Now, the, we all hear about the gastrointestinal tract and the microbiome that's within the GI tract, but we seldom talk about the microbiome that's within the vagina. And just like in the vagina, it is populated by a variety of organisms, bacteria and fungi. Now, what's important with the vagina is that there needs to be a delicate balance within the vagina so that the pH of the vagina stays acidic. If it doesn't, then you can get an overgrowth of bacteria and that's what we call bacterial vaginosis, otherwise known as BV. It's a common complaint. In fact, it's said to be the most common complaint among women between the ages of 15 to 44. Estimated that about 21 million women or about 29% of the women in that age bracket are affected by BV. 
women often describe BV in distressing terms. They say there's a vaginal discharge, there's a foul, fishy odor. It's not necessarily painful, but women find it extremely distressful. So whatever can cause an overgrowth of bacteria in your vagina can lead to BV. Now, in addition to causing inflammation and irritation within the vagina, which is what we call vaginitis, um, the presence of BV is associated with infertility, sexually transmitted infections, and preterm birth. Now, what's interesting is often the standard treatment for bacterial vaginosis is an antibiotic, antibiotic called metronidazole. Often this is prescribed orally. So we have a situation where we're taking an oral antibiotic and we expect it to change our vaginal microbiome. So why can't we do that with food? It's so interesting that all the body parts seem to have a microbiome, not just the stomach, but the skin and, and the reproductive organs. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's pretty much anything that gets exposed to the exterior environment tends to have um, bacteria associated with it. So the studies have shown that an increase in dietary fats is associated with an increased risk of BV. And by dietary fats, they're really, by, by dietary fats, they're primarily focusing on the saturated fats that can be found in butter and fatty cuts of meat, bacon, and cheese. They found that women that have a diet that's high in these saturated fats are at an increased risk for bacterial vaginosis. In terms of carbohydrates, we know that there are lots of different carbohydrates and carbohydrates get converted to glucose in our blood. Each carbohydrate has a specific glycemic index, which talks about how it affects our blood glucose level. What the studies have shown in regards to bacterial vaginosis, if someone's glycemic, glycemic load, and that's different from glycemic index, and I'll try to explain that, a slice of bread might have a specific glycemic index. The glycemic load would vary depending on whether or not I ate one slice versus the whole loaf of bread. So looking at the glycemic load, the higher the glycemic load, the greater the risk or association with bacterial vaginosis. So we know two things, increase in the fats and increase in glycemic load tends to increase a woman's risk for bacterial vaginosis. And what's so interesting about this is that I see women in the office who are taking probiotics to avoid bacterial vaginosis. And the studies are kind of um, ambivalent as to whether they are truly effective or whether you should take an oral probiotic versus a vaginal probiotic. But the point I'm trying to drive home with you is that maybe the first step instead of a probiotic is to look at what you're eating. All right, so now moving on to the next fibroids. Um, I see a lot of women with fibroids in my practice and fibroids are benign tumors that arise out of the muscular wall of the uterus. Now there's a little box in the corner with a diagram of the uterus, fallopian tubes and ovaries um, fibroid tumors develop from within the muscular wall of the uterus. They're not considered cancerous, but they can cause extreme problems such as excessive uterine bleeding, which can lead to anemia, severe menstrual cramp, otherwise known as dysmenorrhea, lower abdominal pelvic pain, infertility. For black women, they tend to occur at an earlier age, they tend to be larger. Black women tend to be more symptomatic with the fibroids and end up with more surgery. In fact, the number one reason for surgery in this country are fibroid tumors. Why do you think there's a disparity that, that this affects disproportionately? 
of Black women? There's been, there's been a lot of discussions People have questioned whether it's genetic. That has not true, been proven to be the case. Most people think it's dietary. Um, so our approach to fibroids for a very long time has been limited. It's um, basically once a woman was identified with fibroids, we would try to determine whether or not she was symptomatic. If she was asymptomatic, we would tell her to wait do nothing until she became symptomatic. And once she became symptomatic, our solution was surgical. Either we would remove the fibroids, which was called a myomectomy, or we would remove the uterus with the fibroids and that would be a hysterectomy. And this is a little strange. It's one of the few medical conditions where we tell the patient, wait until you're symptomatic and then we'll do something. For instance, um, we don't say to the newly diagnosed diabetic, wait until your blood sugar is at a certain level or wait until you have DKA before we start to treat you. Or we don't say to the newly diagnosed hypertensive, um, let's wait until your blood pressure is in the severe range or you've had a stroke and then we'll address it nor do we say to the overweight woman, no, we're gonna wait until you're morbidly obese before we start talking about changes. But that's pretty much been our approach with fibroids for in general. And that's been limited because we have not had a lot to offer, meaning we don't know what causes fibroids. We don't know why one woman will have one and, and another woman will have 25. We don't know why some women keep small fibroids and other women develop large fibroids. So we don't have a complete understanding and we haven't had a lot to offer the women up until this point. But this is, this is one of those things that really bothered me professionally. I was um, looking in the literature and I was seeing where cardiologists were able to reverse severe cardiovascular disease. In fact, I think there's one that's been on your show, Dr. Um, I'm Chef AJ, and that's Dr. Baxter Montgomery. You bet. Able to reverse severe cardiovascular disease by having his patients go on a plant-based diet. And then I've seen literature about the reversal of cancer um, with a plant-based diet. And so the thought is, what is so unique? What is so different that we can't treat this? Meaning we can't treat fibroids by changing a cardio, uh, changing uh, the diet of women to be a plant-based diet. And so this is a particular interest of mine because it would be um, groundbreaking, earth-shaking in the GYN world if in fact we could offer this to women. In fact, it would be something that could be offered before they become symptomatic. Once diagnosed, they would be told, this is what you need to do in order to um, slow down or prevent the growth of the fibroids. To date, there haven't been a lot of studies, but the studies that have been done have shown that if you have a low intake of fruits, a low intake of green vegetables, if you have a documented vitamin D deficiency, you're at an increased risk for developing fibroid tumors. Also, if you have an increased exposure to EDCs, which are endocrine disrupt disruptive chemicals, you're at an increased risk for fibroids. And these EDCs are ubiquitous. We find it in packaging. We find it in um, food preparation. If you have a high volume of EDCs in your diet, or you've exposed to a large volume of NDCs, EDCs, then you're at an increased risk for um, fibroid tumors. But this is clearly one area of medicine that needs more research. Um Dr. Rahman, just in case somebody watching isn't familiar with an endocrine disruptor, could you please say what they are and where people get exposed to them? Sure. EDCs are endocrine 
disruptive chemicals and they are found in pesticides, they're found in packaging. Um, the way that we grow our foods um, with the wide use of pesticides, the way that we package our foods um, in the plastics that we use, people get exposed to these chemicals. Um, we find them in hair care products, we find them in foods, we find them in all sorts of packaging. So it's hard to avoid being exposed to these type of chemicals. And what we need to do is to try to limit exposure as much as possible. Great, thank you. So for instance, one way that you could potentially eliminate exposure is buying organic versus conventional. The difference between organic foods and conventional foods is that conventional foods, um, pesticides are used and a lot of these pesticides will have these quote unquote chemicals. And these EDCs are known to affect the reproductive tract. And I have a little more to say about that later. Great. Okay. All right, so moving on, menopause. Um, so these two diagrams pretty much tell the whole story. First, we should know that the main female hormone is estradiol and the, male, the, the main male hormone is testosterone. Both men and women have both hormones. What's different is the relative amounts that we have. Estradiol as the major female hormone is low at birth. If you follow the chart on the, on the left, you'll see at birth, we're born with low estradiol levels. By the time we reach puberty, our estradiol levels start to increase and they stay elevated while we're in the reproductive years. Estradiol is um, formed by the egg follicles, which are within the ovaries. As we get into our late 40s and 50s, the number of eggs that we have, the number of egg follicles that we have are starting to decrease. The estradiol level starts to decrease. And eventually, the level gets so low that we um, go through menopause. And the definition of menopause is going 12 months or more without a menstrual cycle. So that's the story. Um, and women are different from men. Men have a gradual decline of, of testosterone over the years, but women have a precipitous decline in the, in, at the time of menopause. The other thing which we should note on the other diagram is that we have estrogen receptors throughout our entire body. Um, and what that means is that when our estrogen level gets low, our menopausal symptoms are not just confined to our genitalia. Women sometimes complain of um, hot flashes, palpitations, sleep disturbances, brain fog, um, urinary complaints, vaginal dryness. All of these happen as a result of declining estrogen. As we get older, um, our bones can get weaker as a result of the loss of the estrogen in our bodies. 80% of menopausal women will have some sort of complaint, whether it's hot flashes or night sweats or anxiety or brain fog or sexual dysfunction. And while Estrogen replacement will help because if the problem is there is a deficiency of estrogen, replacing it, not necessarily to the reproductive levels, but replacing it will help to alleviate many of the menopausal symptoms. But many women do not want or feel comfortable taking hormonal replacement because of concerns about breast cancer and endometrial cancer and concerns about such things as blood clots. So two alternatives. Two alternatives that I like to talk about and one is called Estravera. Estravera is a marketed, um, 
dietary supplement produced by a company called Metogenics. Um, it's been in this country since 2009. And what it is, it's a dry ex extract from the root of the rhubarb plant. Um, this particular extract had been used in Germany for many years for menopausal symptoms, actually dating back to the 1950s. Um, it's a dietary supplement and studies have shown that it does help women in the relief of menopausal symptoms. Now, I am not trying to advertise or to endorse Estrovera. The only point is to highlight that an alternative to menopausal symptoms was found in a vegetable. The other <laughs> possibility is soy. There was a recent study published by Dr. Neil Barnard. And I think he's also been on your show, Chef AJ. It's recently talking about that exact study that they did. That's right. This study was published this year in the Menopause Journal. And basically it was a group of 38 menopausal women with hot flashes divided into two groups. And one group had a low fat vegan diet and each day they would have a half a cup of soybeans along with their low fat vegan diet. They were followed 12 weeks and there was a control group that pretty much ate what they wanted to eat. At the end of the 12 weeks, there was a noticeable decrease in the moderate to severe hot flashes in those women who consumed the low fat vegan diet along with the daily supplement of soybeans. And so the point is, you can affect your health by what you eat. And food can be used as medicine. So the last thing that I like to talk about is just the pregnant woman, the pregnant woman and our progeny. So it's a little background. We know that genetics is about the study of DNA. And we know that every cell in our body has the same genetic code, the same DNA. It's the DNA that we inherited from our parents. Yet not every cell in our body looks the same. Not every cell in our body functions the same way. And that brings us to a relatively new study, which is called a field of study, which is called epigenetics. And that's the study of chemicals which can actually attach to our DNA. And once they attach to our DNA, they can either turn on or turn off or alter the function of genes within our cells, which will ultimately affect our health. And so environmental epigenetics are those things in our environment. Um, toxins that we might be exposed to, our own behaviors such as um, smoking or drinking alcohol, or the big one, nutrition, which can affect our epigenetics, which will ultimately send different messages to our cells and lead to different cell function, which can translate in different, into different health outcomes. We know that Nutrition and exposure to toxins are among the lifestyles which have been associated with epigenetic modifications. Um, studies have shown that good nutrition and limiting exposure to toxins is especially important for pregnant women. If you've ever been pregnant, you probably remember your gynecologist telling you to take folic acid. In fact, folic acid, 400 micrograms are recommended daily. It's recommended that you begin it prior to conception and at least for the first 13 weeks of your pregnancy. And one of the reasons is that it helps to decrease birth defects associated with the brain and spine. So we know that what we eat and how we eat can affect us and can potentially affect our children. The studies have also shown that a diet rich in saturated fats, red meats, and empty carbohydrates, low in fresh fruits, and low in vegetables can affect 
the physiologic function of children later in life. Um, so back to the EDCs, chemicals which can interfere with our reproductive tract. They can affect male and female both. Um, I guess this sounds a bit kind of far gone, a bit sci-fi, but this is a real example. Um, you may have heard of a synthetic estrogen called DES that was diethylstilbestrol. This hormone was initially prescribed to pregnant women um, in the 1940s, I think up to the 1970s. It was prescribed to women to help to prevent miscarriages, preterm labor, and complications of pregnancy. It was taken off the market when it was discovered that daughters to women who had taken DES during pregnancy had a 40 times higher risk of developing cancer of the genital tract. Um, these women also had fertility issues and were twice as likely to enter early menopause. The sons of the women that took DES during pregnancy were at an increased risk for testicular and genital abnormalities. And I'm saying that to drive home the point that what we do with our bodies today can affect our children later in life. Um, so the risk of environmental exposure is um, a very real concern to the to the. Um, to the point that there are two professional organizations, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology and the International Federations of Gynecologists and Obstetricians. And they've issued statements basically saying that clinicians should encourage women in the preconception period, women who are pregnant and women who are lactating to eat fruit, vegetables, beans, legumes, whole grains every day, whole food, plant-based diet, and to avoid fast foods and other processed foods whenever possible and limit um, foods with a high animal fat intake. So you have two professional organizations which are pretty much endorsing a plant-based whole food diet for women, not only for the women, but also for the positive effect that will have for their children. So that's a lot, I went through a lot and this is a bit of a discretion, but um, the Olympics just ended last month and during the Olympics, um, a woman ran the 1500 meter in less than four minutes. And back in uh, 1954, that, was, that would have been considered impossible. And so the whole idea of food as medicine um, and not depending primarily on pharmaceuticals or surgery may seem like an impossible thought too, but the human body is capable of extraordinary things. And while changing how we eat may be challenging, it's definitely doable and it's worth the effect. And so now I just like to end by saying, um, embrace and love your body. It's the most amazing thing you will ever own. Um, it's taken me a while to truly appreciate that food can be medicine. And one of the best ways to embrace and love your body is to, is to eat well. Um, I, I would like to maybe um, throw out a challenge to any woman who may be listening to this that um, if you're having any type of female issue, whether it's dysmenorrhea or polycystic ovarian syndrome or any other type of female issue, that one of the things you should look at is what are you eating and trying to, before um, looking for a medication, look to see how you can change your diet. Um, it's truly our choice and we get a chance to, um, to decide what works best for us. Almost every woman that I see in the office when I ask about medications, um, some will say yes and some will say no. But when I ask specifically, do you take 
vitamins or supplements, the vast majority will tell me that they're taking some sort of vitamin or some sort of herb or some sort of supplement that they Googled online and they read about and they thought it would be health. And this is particularly true as everyone is concerned about their health during um, the pandemic. Um, and so to me, what that indicates is that we all truly want to be healthy. We all want to optimize our health in, in the best way that we can. And I um, think about um, T. Colin Campbell, who said our bodies are very complex and there are lots of complex interactions that go on. So it just might be easier and cheaper to just eat well, meaning eat plant-based whole foods rather than trying to supplement, picking a supplement to um, derive a benefit. So that is the end of my presentation. Wow. Thank you. And I thank you for listening. Um, and thank you, Chef AJ, for giving me this opportunity. Well, thank you. This was a wonderful presentation. I know I'm going to have to watch it again when I'm not also monitoring the chat. You know, and I never, when I think about it, uh, Dr. Rahman, I'm six, almost 62. And until a year ago, when I got a lifestyle medicine doctor, I've never even had a doctor ask me what I'm eating. Oh, if you'd like to stop screen share now, then we can see your beautiful face and the beautiful photos that everybody's, com not photos, but artwork behind you that everybody's commenting on. Ah, yes. All right. Nice to have you back. I, 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 I can't, I love that art. I can't help but keep saying that because it, it reminds me of some of my favorite artists. Yeah, I, I like it. It's in the office and I consider these my supporters, my cheerleaders. It's just beautiful. So, you know, uh, people are asking lots of questions. So however many you have time for, like one of them from Suki is on fibroids. Does having fibroids affect how you go through menopause and the symptoms you have? So as the diagram showed, when we go through menopause, our fibroid, our estrogen levels tend to decrease. As a result of the decrease, our fibroids tend to get smaller. So a lot of times what we'll do with a woman that's close to menopause, we'll try to do those things that will um, make her life more manageable until she gets to menopause, expecting the fibroids to get smaller, um, expecting her to be less symptomatic once she enters menopause. Right. Have you ever heard of therapeutic water only fasting? Because I used to work at the True North Health Center and Dr. Goldhammer has had some good results with women with fibroids, either shrinking them or having them disappear through water fasting. I just recently learned of, of Dr. Goldwater, but um, I think it's possible. I think it's possible, but the problem with food is that food is so much more than nutrition for us. Food has a lot of connotations. Um, we think of our good times and our bad times and often it's associated with food and changing how we eat is a, uh, a journey. It's a journey and it's experience and we have to get to a point in our life where we feel that um, it's worth the change and maybe the initial um, uh, uncomfortableness of making that change until we start to see the benefit. And then after that, we're usually sold. Right, that's great. People are asking if they're over 65 and their doctor still wants them to have pap smears and mammograms, do they still need to do that after 65? It depends on their history. I mean, um, we Oh no, please don't tell me she let, went away. Oh, I don't know what it is. If you guys were here last week, we had some problems, but she did give a beautiful presentation. I'll hang out a little bit and see if she comes back. Obviously, I can't answer these questions because I'm not a doctor, but always know that if you send them in, you'll get priority. By that, I mean not to email me, but to respond to the email you get from Chef AJ's Healthy Kitchen. So if you're a subscriber at chefaj.com once a week, usually on Sunday, we send out an email with the lineup for the entire week. And responding to that email goes to the right place so that your question gets to the top of the queue. Trying to email me or text personally or text me, no, that, and, and those are questions for guests. So people think like, uh, just want me to answer a question, email me or no, that best way is for the show to, to answer that email. It comes out on Sunday. We don't send out a lot of emails unless we have something interesting. So please consider subscribing at chefaj.com. See, because what you guys may not understand is 
you see a different chat than I do because I'm streaming to about 10 places. And so anybody in the different, I stream to a lot of private Facebook groups that I'm a member in, as well as my Facebook page. The best place, of course, to watch is on YouTube because that chat actually stays there. So I don't see it because it disappears quickly for me. So I know that might not make sense if you've never used technology like Restream, but you guys can see the chat wherever you're posting. Whatever I type goes to all these different places, but that's why I'm not trying to be like, make it difficult for you, but I really don't see your questions. They go very quickly. Like I remember I saw one that zipped by, what do I do for anxiety? That would be Dr. Doug Lyle at esteemdynamics.com. You can make an appointment. So um, let me see if I can call her and see if she can reconnect again. And uh, let's see if I can, there we go. Let's see if I can get her on the phone. I'm not home, you can probably see. Yeah, do you wanna come back or should I end the show, Dr. Roman? It was a great presentation. There were more questions, but um, what would you prefer to do? You don't know if you can get back up. Is it because your power went away? <laughs> yeah, well, it's up to you. We could, we could have you back again and, and we can get questions if you like. There were questions on painful sex, vulvodynia, um, yeah. All right. Come back. Come back for a straight up Q&A. We'll schedule that. OK, take care. It was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. OK, bye bye. Well, there you have it. I guess I could have put her on speakerphone. So unless you need something from me in the chat, I guess I will end the show and just tell you who's on for tomorrow. If you're on my mailing list, you know who's on the whole week. And except for today and Sunday, we have double shows all week. So we have Two, and of course, if you're in FFOF, we have Dr. Frank Sabatino today at four. So tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m., we have two fabulous ladies, Brooke Alley and Patricia Thompson, who have new books out. They'll be doing a cooking demo at 2 p.m. We have Judy Finneran, who has a new book out, who had lost a tremendous, tremendous amount of weight. On Friday, we have Dr. Melinda Graham. And on Saturday, we have Tracy Childs doing a cooking demo based on soy, which the doctor today said is very good for menopause. And then at 2 p.m., we have Melissa, who was on Shark Take. She founded a vegan product called One a Date. It's a date paste that comes in five flavors. And then on Sunday, we have Dr. Megan Griga, not Gregor, but Griga, and she's a lifestyle medicine doctor. So there you have it for the week. If you get on the mailing list, you have it all right there to know. I think that's it, other than to tell you that uh, in two days on the 10th, I said it was a hit the stands and I was wrong. Forks Over Knives, the new magazine comes out and it's fantastic. They have a story with me on that episode or that episode magazine, I keep thinking. And then they have my favorite product section. So check it out, it's a wonderful magazine and uh, it uh, has great recipes compliant recipes according to me and beautiful photos. So I'll just check real quick to see if there's any more questions for me, doesn't look like. So thanks guys. Where am I chef AJ says Elizabeth. I'm in Big Bear trying to write my next book because I thought it might be easier to do it up here, but you know what? There's no place like home, but we're still having a wonderful time and it's not hot at all. And we'll have her back for a Q and A Monarch, no worries. Um, thank you for your nice compliment, Monique. I'm wondering how many times a day Oh my God. Okay, anytime you write a negative comment, not only do you get deleted, but you get blocked. And so you'll have to create another name to get back on. So we don't, we don't take smack talk here or trolls. So I'm gonna push this wonderful eject button. Bye-bye. <laughs> and bye-bye to all you wonderful people who show up every day. We really appreciate you being here. It wouldn't be a show without you today. I think was show number, let me tell you, 655, wow. That's pretty good. All right, take care everyone and we'll see you tomorrow.